All right. Hello. Good morning, party people. And it is a wonderful, chillaxed morning here in San Diego. I had a nice uh, goof off day from the bed. Okay, that's interesting. Aries and I are uh, in bed together. Uh, yeah, I had a nice goof off day yesterday. My, my big project for this five day weekend is to uh, have everything finished for my Black Friday sale. Every year I do a big Black Friday sale and do like 70, 80% off a bunch of stuff. Uh, but I do a lot of marketing kind of things, a lot of emails leading into it, free classes, all kinds of things. Two hours one way, holy smokes. Well, wow, Richie, dang, that is... You know, and Florida's a really long state, so it's like it's easy to, to burn two hours going in one direction. Richie's starting out about as far south as you can get in the continental United States without having to be in a Jimmy Buffett song if he goes any further south. Wow, jeez. Uh, I like Mrs. Clippy. Uh, good morning, good morning. So uh, today we'll do totally open question and answer. Any questions y'all want to ask about SQL Server? I am always amazed that there uh, continue to be questions. You know, we've done office hours webcasts from back when we had Teams, when uh, we had, when it were like three or four of us, and down to when there was just me. Uh, and I was always amazed at just uh, how many questions there just continue to be. And that they're different. That uh, Richie, you know, was funny, I was going to actually show the Black Friday marketing calendar, like everything that I have to do in order to set up all these staged emails and different webcasts and stuff. So it was, I was like debating, should I go through that this morning? But I think I'll do a separate, uh, uh, separate webcast. Yo, Adam Saxton. Yo. Uh, yes, I love that, that keyboard. I don't usually leave it on for lights 24 seven. I just only like turning it on for the webcast. And of course it has all kinds of different lighting patterns that it'll go through and do. And so I kind of like how some of them are separate, how, like weird sideways. Good morning, Mossy Moss. So I kind of like how they it shows different stuff when it's uh, on coming from the side, which is kind of cute. Akil says, the car is back. I rotate different cars in and out. That one's back to my, my Porsche uh, because I feel guilty. I was like... I was, I was this close to buying another car. My wife and I were talking about there's one car that she would give me permission to buy. And I was like right teetering on the edge. And I'm like, I have no business owning another car. I work from home. We're, our apartment lease is up in like February. I, I don't know that, well, technically it's up in December. We're going to try and do month to month for a couple of months. And then we're aiming to shoot off for Iceland for three months. Uh, to Depending on if I get a work visa, we'll stay even longer. A DeLorean. I do like DeLoreans, but I would get a different engine. I've always wanted to do like an, L, not always, but I would do an LT1 swap into a DeLorean. But just a regular DeLorean, I'd like my fire because they're, they're slow as hell. Uh, so it, that makes it uh, kind of tricky. Uh, so Subir Surbi asks, we'll do that as the first question, what else is important in an actual execution plan other than to find out parameter sniffing? So for me, it boils down to what's the server's biggest problem? So depending on, for example, if the server's biggest problem is blocking, then I want to know what kind of locks that query is taking. If the server's biggest problem is memory grants, then I want to look at the memory grants in the plan. If it's CPU, I want to look at the CPU in the plan. Because even if it's not parameter sniffing, the query could just suck every time, right? It's not like it just sucks sometimes, it sucks every single time. So. Uh, let's see here. I'll uh, add a couple of queries over to the uh, over to the queue there. So there we go. Got those in. Justin says the DeLorean only needs to hit 88. Uh, yes, but it's how quickly you get to 88. If you've ever been in a Volkswagen van, for example, you know that they'll hit 60 miles an hour but you could read a book in the time that it takes it to get to 60 miles an hour. I'm not saying that you need to get a VW bus any faster to 60 miles an hour, because in a VW bus, you are the crumple zone. You know, it's not like you really want to get in an accident with that thing. But for me, it's like, I'm not going to really go that fast top end, but it's how quickly can I get there? And after all, of course, if you're driving a DeLorean, you have to escape the terrorists in the mall parking lot, right? You know, you got to get there faster. Mm. So Aries asks, Besides SQL, uh, what else does Clip, besides Clip, I think he's saying besides SQL and Clippy, what else does uh, Brent like? Brent likes vacations. Brent does not like working at all. Brent really likes not working. Brent likes sitting at, at the side of the beach 
do, I don't really like getting in the water that much. I mean, I, I will get in the water, and I do like body and surfing and stuff like that. I'm, I can swim, but not like professionally by any means. I, like I would lose anybody, a race with anybody, but I can swim okay. Um, and uh, so I, I, I like uh, being near the ocean and seeing the animals, you know, dolphins, whales, and all that, hearing the crashing noises, having my iPad, and drinking a lot, you know, eating Mexican food, drinking margaritas, that kind of thing. So that's, that's my idea of a good time. Iceland, too, the reason that we're going over to Iceland, Iceland sounds like the opposite of that, right? But they actually have the ocean there. It's, uh, you get a lot of beautiful beaches, stunning beaches in Iceland. And it's not really that bad because I, it's not like I'm getting in the water and it's going to be cold anyway. So it's I'm, kind of don't really miss anything. The scenery is unbelievable. Uh, all right, let me copy a couple of the questions over into the chat. We'll see from YouTube. We'll ask that and then we'll copy this over and from YouTube. <laughs> Richie says, Richie says, uh, Richie likes working. Richie doesn't drive four hours for one soccer game. That's true. All right, let's see the next question here. Uh, let's ask that, put that up in there. So uh, Greg says, any tips for a DBA forced to do a lot of Power BI work? And the reason why I put that on was uh, Adam Saxton is here, because Adam Saxton is Guy in a Cube of the epically, beautifully produced Guy in a Cube YouTube channel uh, with him and Patrick LeBlanc. So if anybody would give somebody tips for a DBA force to do a lot of Power BI work, that's the place where I would start. So one, one tip that I would give you is go follow Guy in a Cube's YouTube channel. And I'm not saying that just because he's here. That's how I learn when I'm having, I don't actually go out and proactively watch all their videos because they put out a ton of content. But when I want to find a, a solution to a problem that I'm facing in Power BI, I tend to search for that problem plus Guy in a Cube because I know that the videos that I'm going to get from them are going to do a good job of walking me through the problem in a fun way. Um, I, that for me is was the biggest uh, starting point. I don't know that I have another learning resource that I really liked a lot in terms of how to get started with Power BI. That That's true. You have to make a decision right from the get-go. Do you want to load the entire data set into Power BI, or do you want to have Power BI make the queries every single time? Um, and architecturally, that can also have to do with the size of your data set. Like when I first got started working with Power BI, my uh, data could fit entirely in Power BI, and I would just pull it all down in one fire hose and not uh, have to worry about doing any processing later. But then over time, I got to the point where the data is just too large to fit in Power BI. And I can't do direct query because I'm working with Amazon Aurora, which has to be accessed via the damn gateway. I like Power BI. I love Power BI, but it's still there. Just it's so close with a couple things that I need to do, and not just quite there yet. Not that it stops me from using it. It's still the only uh, GUI data front end that I use for Amazon Aurora. So that's pretty cool. Uh, next up, uh, from YouTube, uh, YouTube viewer asks, is MySQL faster than SQL Server? I'm looking for any authority who can answer me this question. It's kind of like saying, what's faster, Chevys or Fords? It all depends on the specific hardware that you use and where you're trying to drive them. For example, are you taking it off-road or are you running it around the Nürburgring? So there really is no answer about which one is faster overall. It's for specific scenarios, specific access patterns, what it is that you're trying to do. And I'll give you an example, data warehousing. With data warehousing, if you look up the uh, benchmarks for TPC, the transaction processing something or other for benchmarks for TPC, you're not going to see MySQL up anywhere in the charts. It's exclusively Oracle, uh, SQL Server, I can't remember if DB2 is still up in the charts or not, but those kinds of systems are very highly optimized by expensive database systems that MySQL just can't even hold a candle to it. However, if you're going to do, for example, sharding out across thousands of servers and uh, uh, split the data across all of them to deliver your results, you can end up with better performance from MySQL as long as your application knows how to handle the sharding, which, SQL, which MySQL server it needs to connect to. So that's why you're not finding a single answer from an expert. It's like saying, what's faster, Chevy or Ford? Uh, from YouTube, a stored procedure uses a number of multiple temp tables to speed this up. Is this okay? 
I smell something weird. When you say a number of multiple temp tables, 16, in order to speed things up, what I'm guessing is that they're pulling down a large amount of data and repeatedly processing over it, like step one, then step two, then step three. And they're kind of treating SQL Server more as an application than they are a database server. I'm just guessing, though. So does it pass the smell test? No, I'd probably want to know a little bit more about that because something about that smells a little fishy. Now, do temp DBs, are, temp DB, uh, are temp tables useful for performance tuning? Absolutely, and I talk about it a lot in my mastering query tuning class. In my three-day mastering query tuning class, we cover how you use temp tables when CTEs uh, aren't efficient or when somebody's trying to join like 40 tables together. Some Sometimes you need to do some pre-processing with the first couple of tables into temp tables so SQL Server can understand how the rest of the joins are going to work. Uh, let's see, let's add a couple more into here. Let's see here. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. All right, there we go. Uh, just PK says, uh, why are there no feature of temporary functions in T-SQL? Well, because most of us, we're not employed for only a day or two. We're employed for longer periods of time. I understand uh, why you want temporary functions, because you go and put your code into production, and then they fire you within 48 hours. You want to make sure your functions don't stick around. But I got great news. Eventually, you're not going to suck so bad at your job. Eventually, things will be stable enough, and they'll let you put your code into production permanently. Now, that joking aside, there actually are temporary functions and temporary stored procedures in SQL Server. You just got to know how to create them. Let's do one. So to do one, normally we think about stored procedures as create or alter uh, proc, DBO, USP, and I'm just going to make a stupid one. Uh, get date as select get date. So normally this is the way that we think of permanent stored procedures. Well, just like you create temp tables, you can create temp stored procedures. So here I'll go execute that. And then when I want to exec it, I can just say exec USP get date. And it works for me and my session and only my session. So that's how you do temporary stored procedures. You can do the same thing with global temp stored procedures by putting two pound signs in front of it. The trick is these disappear whenever the last session that referenced them closes. So you, they won't just stick around permanently. There are hacky workarounds for that, but generally I, when I need to create a temporary one, I just create one temporary to my own session. It's useful for uh, those of us who are consultants when folks say, you're not allowed to create any store procedures in production, but you have to fix it right away. And so I'll use this trick in order to create temporary ones for performance tuning testing. All right, back over here. <laughs> Let's see. Drop Table Employees says, is there a schedule of your live classes somewhere on your site? Yes, if you click training up at the top for each of the classes, every one of the classes has its own schedule. And that's normally how I would recommend going through the classes, is find the class that you want, not the next upcoming date. However, those of you who have a live class season pass, you can look at my site and have a list of uh, links inside there and you see the upcoming uh, classes. Um, John, I'm not sure. Uh, oh, is it new? Uh, so they're both databases. So C SQL Server is, is a database just like uh, MySQL is. It's just from a different company, and it's really, really expensive. So you make more money. Next up, uh, let's see. Oh, this is tricky. Um, Scuderia says, if you had the power to, that's the Italian like racing word, uh, if you had the power to change or fix one thing in SQL Server, what would you change? This is so tricky, and I've thought about this a few times. Um, because uh, people assume, because I, I write some posts that kind of poop on Microsoft. Uh, I write from time to time, I'll be like, this feature sucks, or this is a really bad idea, or why would you do it this way? But you know what? For the most part, I don't really need anything desperately from SQL Server. I'm really pretty happy. You know what I wish we had? Less bugs. Less bugs. I would really go for less bugs. 
Because after all, if we think about uh, the number of cumulative updates that we come out, like CU7 for SQL Server 2019 just came out like 30 days ago, and they had to pull it out because they didn't do enough quality control testing, and then they ended up making things worse instead of better. Uh, so I'm just always sketchy with that. I, I think if I had to choose uh, one thing to improve, uh, it would have to have a better way of fixing parameter stiffing like store yeah that ab adam you're absolutely right a better way of fixing parameter sniffing by storing multiple execution plans for each query and use varying <laughs> ouch use varying execution plans based on the size of the data now oracle does stuff like that sql server not so much and of course mysql and postgres because we have mysql people inside here you're not even close um, but that would be the one thing that i would probably wish for and aim for I, other than that i don't really Query plans are great. T SQL is great. I don't think I ever uh, find myself going, dang it, I can't do X in SQL Server. Um, I love where they're going with Azure SQL DB and hyperscale and managed instances. All of those things are great. Okay, okay. I, one other thing I, I kind of sort of wish is that Standard Edition wasn't limited to 128 gigs of RAM. Um, I wish that you could go to, say, 256 gigs of RAM. Adam, you're, you're right. But the thing is, see, for example, with my consulting business, I am mostly of my clients are on 2016 and 2017. If Microsoft fixed parameter sniffing in the next version, I'd still be having a great time doing consulting for five or ten years. You know, it, it would just take a long time before people go through and adopt the new versions. Drop tables has 3D query plans. That's true. I'll give you uh, credit for that as well. Uh, all right, let's add a couple into here. So there we go. Let's go put the next one in is um, Pro Hiller says any sneak peek regarding your Black Friday training pricing. If a lot of you say please, I'll let you go see it. Uh, Ariel says, uh, what's the optimal definition of minimum memory usage? Be more specific about the problem you're trying to solve, because I, I don't know what you mean by, are you talking about the query level, the server level, like resource pools? Uh, be more specific about that. Just PK, is there streaming service for SQL Server when querying huge amounts of data? Tell me more about what the problem that you're trying to solve, because your definition of huge is probably different than other people's. Like for me, my definition of huge is 10 terabytes in one table and above. Several of you are asking. All right, cool. So here, let's go take a look. So if you go to brentozar.com, and you're going to have to put a URL in because it's not like out anywhere on the menus yet. But if you go slash Black Friday, so if you go brentozar.com slash Black Friday, Here's the pricing that's in effect, and it's out there already, but I, I just haven't shown it to anybody yet, because people who are recurring subscribers, they get to get in before most of the public does. So level one fundamentals, this is a bundle that includes my recorded class season pass, SQL Constant Care, the consultant toolkit. If you bought all three of these individually, it would normally be about 1500 bucks. If you buy it during November, you get 80% off, so it's 295 to watch all my recorded fundamentals classes, the senior DBA class, uh, the DBA interview Q&A, fundamentals of column store, fundamentals of parameter sniffing, like all, I don't know, 7 to 30, 40 hours worth of videos. So that one is 295. Then level two includes all of that plus a live class season pass. So you can attend all of my live classes for one year straight. That one's 995. You save 82%, like five grand. Yeah, don't touch that. That setting's five. Just leave it to zero. Don't touch that one. Then finally, a level two for two years straight. Because what I had was I had a lot of people come to me and go, hey, Brent, it's just as easy for me to go to the company just once and ask for two or 3000 bucks. Just let me go once, and I'll take care of my career for a while. Plus two that way, if I quit and I go to another company, I can change the email address on my account, and I can keep learning if I go to a, a cheap uh, company as well. 
No, I don't accept trades for weed, cocaine, or anything else like that. It's just plain old what we call money. It's kind of an old concept, but it works really well. Um, so that one, level two for two years, 1600 bucks. Basically, you get a whole other year for just 600 bucks, bringing the savings up to like 86%. So there you go. Uh, Ariel, don't, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. What, don't, don't change a setting. And like, why'd you set min equals to max? That's a bad idea. Don't touch that. Put that back where it was. Microsoft had min at zero. I understand if you want to set max, don't set min. That, that's a bad idea. Um, Mr. Robot, all of my attendees are students because I'm a teacher. These are, these are classes. So there you go. All right, so there's that one. Let's come back over here to your general q and And then the emails for that will start going out around uh, 1st of November. Exposure bucks. I think you mean query bucks. <laughs> Exposure bucks. That's pretty funny. Um, uh, Yahoo says on YouTube, and there's some on Twitch, and I'll get to those in a second, but Yahoo says, are the defaults for Azure SQL DB and managed instances the same as bad in standard instances? Yes, uh, absolutely. So ne next up, let's see here. Next up, our Ajo says we're using a sharding pattern. Roughly how much data or how many rows would you recommend per database? So for me, what it comes down to is they're striking a balance between cheap hardware and uh, pain in the rear management. Because the more boxes that you shard across sideways, more VMs, whatever, the more that you shard across sideways, the more management that you have to do, the more high availability and disaster recovery that you have to deal with. Um, the larger you go in size, the more you have a tough time in terms of hardware. So the clients that I have doing sharding tend to shard so that to the point where they have twice as much memory as they have data. So if you're at the point where you can buy like a terabyte of memory per pizza box, you can put 500 gigs of data per server. The reason why they do that is that the data is going to grow and they're not going to change memory immediately. So they want to be at the point when they they want to be at the point where they can still continue to grow, caching most of their data in RAM, and then still deal with that same sharding setup. And then a year or two later, they go back and revisit the number of boxes. Uh, Hanny says, oh, good to see you, Hanny. Hanny says, uh, no questions. Just wanted to say thank you, Brent, for all the knowledge you're sharing in the community. You're welcome. I appreciate it. I always uh, uh, have a good time uh, sharing this kind of stuff, so it's a lot of fun. Uh, next up, Life Extinguisher says, uh, I'm a production DBA who wants to switch over to Dev DBA. My resume never gets shortlisted. Any tips? As soon as you're facing a list, if your resume is in a stack, if your resume is in a stack with other people, you're screwed. You're not going to get the job. Rather than going through the stack of strangers, what you want to do is network with everyone you've uh, worked with and over the past and currently. Because all of them are going to go out and get a different job away from that poop hole where you work today. Uh, when they go off to another company, you want them to remember what you're good at or what it is that you love to do. So for that, you go in, just send emails to catch up. Hey, you know, we used to work together at Acme, you know, fire extinguishers. Um, just wanted to let you know, that if you need any help with query performance tuning or indexing, just let me know. I always enjoyed working with you, so um, I'd be glad to help you out any way that I can. So that way you don't say that you're work asking for a job. If somebody gets the email, the rumors don't go out that you're looking for a job, you're just genuinely offering to help them because you did like working with them and you want to work with them again. Uh, so that if you if you stop and think about it and you go, oh my God, none of the people I've ever worked with are ever going to want to work with me again, that probably says something too. Because I know I was at that point in my career when I first got that advice. I was like, I don't want to work with any of those buttholes. Turns out that everywhere you go, everyone's a butthole. It's not just the one place. It's all buttholes everywhere. Buttholes, buttholes everywhere. Brent Osar's uh, human resources advice. Uh, so you, you just got to get good at sucking it up and being good to other people that you work with and that you, because eventually they're all going to be your future coworkers or clients. <laughs> uh, let's see. Next up, uh, to do, to do, grab a couple of those. Um, oh, not the DBA you're looking for says, I assume that you're still not uh, doing selling to the EU. Yeah, I really wanted to this year. Uh, but when the EU struck down the privacy shield law, 
that means I can't really store data about uh, EU customers inside an American's uh, database server. So I'm not really going to bother with that then, because at that point, I would really have to forklift up all my data and shove it over into the EU, like my American customers would be over there. The website lag would suck too bad, and I don't want to deal with any of that kind of privacy uh, rule type stuff. And the EU is only like 5% of my revenue, so I'm like, okay, I'm holding it off for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. People try that too all the time. People are like, I'm going to try from, you know, Bob in Florida, but we match your credit card billing address, your IP address, all kinds of other stuff. And so then people are like, Arr. Next up, uh, John says, what would you recommend for a SQL database for a website? Is MySQL and PHP admin fine? So it depends on what your skills are. If you're skilled with MySQL, then just use MySQL. Uh, what you generally find is that in enterprises, if you go to work for, a, I'm just going to name big companies, General Motors, uh, AMC Theaters, you know, just like big giant uh, chains of companies, they're often more comfortable with enterprise-y software products because they tend to offer things like auditing, tighter security access control, 24-7 support from like a big global company. Um, but if you're just building something yourself, MySQL's totally fine. Postgres is totally fine. I would probably lean push people more towards Postgres than I would MySQL. Postgres seems to be a lot more vibrant these days. And we use Postgres ourselves for our own stuff. I use MySQL for my WordPress op installation, obviously, but we use Postgres for our software as a service stuff. And Postgres and DynamoDB, which is also as wonderful. Nothing against Azure. Azure just didn't have the database stuff and NoSQL stuff that I wanted at the time that we started the software as a service products. But yeah, Brent, Brent does use MySQL and cPanel and PHP MyAdmin too as well. I'm not good at it. I just use it. <laughs> Abused sysadmin says, would a temp stored procedure have any use in dynamic SQL? No, because effectively when you write dynamic SQL, it is a temp stored procedure. It's kind of the same thing. But I love where your mind is going, like that you you have a dirty mind, and I like it. Uh, I love where your mind is going, that you could theoretically create a temp stored procedure in Dynamic SQL. I just don't think it would really service any purpose. Because if you're going to type out all the queries in Dynamic SQL, you just run them. You don't need a stored procedure for it. But neat, neat question. That's uh, kind of cool. Neil on YouTube asked, uh, what are your tips for dev DBAs? Any do's or don'ts? Well, I highly recommend my training classes. <laughs> If you go over to brentozar.com and you click on training up at the top, I have whole classes just full of my tips and do's and don'ts for uh, professional database administrators and development DBAs and developers. Enjoy. So could I sum it all up inside one question and answer? Uh, yeah, obviously not. That's why I sell all these cool things. <laughs> Next up over here, let's see here. Let's add a couple of things into the queue. Um, Andy Leonard says, that's funny. Uh, Andy Leonard says, "My I'm self-employed. My boss is a jerk sometimes. What's the great uh, line that's out there? It's like, why work 40 hours a week for someone else when you could work 80 hours a week for yourself? <laughs> And it's truly true. Like those of us, Andy's a freelancer like I am, or, you know, company founder or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and the, the, if you want to be your own boss, you really end up working way more than you probably would for someone else. I know a lot of you work for someone else and you think that you work hard. Well, if you looked at your checkbook and the amount in your checkbook was exactly tied to the number of hours that you worked, um, the temptation is there to work continuously and burn yourself out. So that can be kind of stressful. Uh, El Getty says, I want to learn Azure. Any recommendations or resources, please? Search for at Microsoft Azure training, and Microsoft has tons of free training material. The rest of us who are like professional trainers, we can't keep up with that because Azure keeps changing. So if I were to go write a course on Azure, it would be outdated by the time that I finish building the course, and so I would lose money on building it. So it's kind of tricky. Uh, Yahoo, that's a great question. No, it's not because those don't have plan caches. They have to build a brand new execution plan every time. So they have high CPU usage for other reasons. That's why it's really tough to get them to scale to say 100,000, 200,000 queries per second because they have to build an execution plan every time. 
Uh, Bluetooth says, what kind of features does SQL Server offer for geographical datas and data and queries? So Microsoft SQL Server offers uh, spatial data, so you can store data basically in latitude and longitude. It feels like one of those checkbox fe box features where they wanted to be competitive with all the other cool kids who are doing it. So you can do it. It's just that very few people are doing it in Microsoft SQL Server. Just not a lot of people are using that particular feature. So the support doesn't tend to be robust. The documentation isn't all that in depth. It's hard to find other people you can hire off the street who are doing it, as opposed to Postgres. Postgres is a much more popular uh, tool for spatial data. So if you were gonna pick a platform, I'd probably pick Postgres. If you were using SQL Server for everything else that you do, then that would be different. Then you would just use spatial inside SQL Server. All right, let me copy a couple of queries from over from a YouTube queries. Uh, let me copy these over here. So from YouTube, paste that in there. And then I think that, uh, do, 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 do. Oh, one other one. Hold on a second here. Copy this from YouTube, paste that over there. And there we go. Now let me add the other ones to the queue. Add, add, and add. Okay, good. So, uh, GeoCerm says, a friend of mine got mad Googling this. I like how you said that there. That's pretty smart. You're a regular viewer. You're paying attention. When uh, joining tables from two different databases on the same SQL Server instance, are stats from both databases used as if the tables were on a single database? Yes. As far as query execution goes, you won't really see that much of a difference, and I'll clarify that much here in a second. You won't really see that much of a difference if the tables are in two separate databases. Doesn't matter for performance in any way, shape, or form. The place where it can catch you is, depending on which database you run your query in, you'll inherit database scoped configurations, like MaxDOP, which can be set at the database level since like SQL Server 2016. So, but otherwise it doesn't matter as long as they're on the same server. If they're on different servers, that's a totally different ball game. Game. And just generally speaking, I would tell people don't do that. But as long as they're on two different databases on the same server, you're fine. Next up, uh, one of the viewers from YouTube says, my first question, your thoughts about using graph databases in SQL Server. You know how just a second ago I was describing uh, spatial data features in SQL Server? And I said, it kind of feels like one of those checkbox features, like Microsoft needed to check the box that they were compatible with spatial we have spatial the cool kids have json data we have json data um, that's how it kind of feels with graph databases other people have graph we have graph and they check the box like they're just trying to be competitive in some gartner uh quadrant thing um if you're starting from scratch and you're thinking about putting a graph data inside sql server I generally tell people, if you're just getting started, use the cheapest tool for the job. And SQL Server isn't the cheapest job, cheapest tool for graph databases, nor is it anywhere near the most mature. Uh, so my, my thoughts on that are usually don't do that. If you're just starting a graph database from scratch, go pick a graph database rather than putting it in SQL Server. If you have an, a big established database, say 100 gigs or above, and you just need to store a little bit of graph stuff, well then sure, you could put that inside SQL Server and just extend your application a little without having to introduce some other database that you don't really know how to manage. Uh, DB Augie says, the client will not tolerate off-premises database, yet it seems like Azure SQL is rapidly replacing SQL Server. Must Azure SQL always be oriented to support off-premises implementations? You have a few different questions inside there. So number one, the client will not tolerate off-premises databases. This is going to be like a, uh, a uh, tipping point where all of a sudden a whole lot of people who weren't satisfied with off-premises are going to be suddenly satisfied with them. Because really at the end of the day, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google suck way less at managing backups than we do. Same thing with security. You can do a bad job of security on-premises. You can do a bad job of security off-premises. It's kind of the same thing. 
But this is yet that seems that Azure is rapidly replacing SQL Server. That's just Microsoft's marketing. Because if you go up to Azure, they make money on you every single month. Whereas if you buy SQL Server, they only make money if you renew your licensing software assurance. So it's kind of a little tricky. Um, so he said, do, uh, uh, like, do I need to worry about uh, knowing Azure SQL DB or whatever? I, I love, I think it's a really interesting product, but the thing is, any time you spend learning it today, the stuff that you learn today may be outphased or outmoded by the time that you go to use it. So if you're not using it, doesn't really hurt that bad to hold off for another six months or a year until your company's starting to consider it. Every now and then, you'll hear a blogger go, if you're not learning Azure SQL DB, you're a dinosaur. That's a load of hooey. I know a lot of dinosaurs who are still making great money on good old SQL Server. And I know a lot of people who thought they knew Azure SQL DB and don't know Jack and can't find work using it. So it's, it's, it's kind of all over the map there. Uh, let's see here. Next up, uh, and to Adam says, hey, on-premises isn't dead, far from it. Yeah, absolutely. They mentioned be between Azure and on-prem SQL and the latest Ignite. What Microsoft's trying to do is this ARC data services thing where you're going to be able to run Azure SQL DB on-premises uh, and manage both your on-premises SQL servers and in the cloud SQL servers and your Azure SQL DB all from the same UI. They are writing this thing as fast as they possibly can because they want to get your money regardless of where your data is stored. So yes, Azure SQL DB will be available on premises. Yes, you'll be able to manage your, uh, your SQL servers in both ways. Exactly. Seven Lies nails it. They'll only stop selling it when they're not making money from it. And if you go and learn at ARC today, I, I wouldn't spend five minutes of my life learning ARC because nobody's using it and it's going to change so much in the next one, two, three years you'll have flushed that learning time down the toilet. Next up, Seven Lies asked, uh, from a DBA consulting perspective, what does a great sysadmin look like and what does a terrible sysadmin look like? A great sysadmin has the books open, as in, if a DBA comes in and says, I'm having a problem with VMware performance, sys, uh, SAN performance, my, the number of cores that I have, a great sys, sysadmin goes, well, sit down next to me. Well, not, not in the day and age of Corona, but, you know, virtually. Okay, so what do you want to know? Let me, let's go in and look at the management tools. I'll show you anything that you want to know. I don't have anything to hide. If I'm doing something wrong, I want to learn about it. You know, I, I want to improve my skills, sharpen my knives. So let's look through together and see what we find out. A terrible sysadmin, when the DBA is having a problem, is like, I can't show you anything. You do, no, no, no. I'll get back to you in a few months. And you know what they're doing is they're trying to Google to cover their rear. Dude, like our, us as database administrators, we suck too. We suck at database administration. We don't know what we're doing. And if a DBA tells you that they do, they're lying. I don't know what I'm doing. I'll be the first one to tell you that. Half the time when y'all are asking me questions, I would be like, okay, let's go Google for that together. Okay, here's the answer. Now go with God. Uh, next up, Adam asked, isn't everybody working off-premises these days? Why can't data be stored off-premises? I'll give you a great one from a client that I was recently working with. They had a manufacturing floor, so they had a big plant, and they had all these machines on the factory floor that were pushing data directly into SQL Server, and then their other manufacturing machines would pull the data out and use that to make decisions. Uh, uh, for example, if you're assembling keyboards, every time you get a shipment, uh, a new pallet of parts, every time a, a keyboard moves from one place to another in the assembly line, who it's going to be uh, going off to, and so forth. So the, the client that I was working with, they couldn't go to the cloud because of the amount of data they were sending and receiving from their on-premises uh, manufacturing machines. The latency wasn't as big of a deal. It was the costs. When you push and pull data back and forth out of the cloud, you pay for that by the amount of data that you push and pull back. So that's a great classic example of someone who simply couldn't afford to go to the cloud today. So much more convenient to have it all on premises. 
Farshid asks, Brent, do you support the idea of turning hyper-threading off? Um, I mean, for highly concurrent applications that open many connections. No, 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 generally speaking, hyper-threading is pretty good. There's one exception, which is, if you need the CPU cache, if your application is highly dependent on how much CPU cache you have, just because you turn on hyper-threading doesn't give you twice as much CPU cache. Your cache is effectively cut in half per core. Uh, so it can backfire under very specific workloads, but these days I'll turn it on by default and just rock and roll. Uh, especially since you don't pay twice the licensing, as long as you're licensing at the host level. So go for it. Um, the number of what people say for many connections, if you're talking like 10, 20,000, sure, but before that, not quite so much. Uh, next up, uh, Cultivart says, MongoDB is the future, guys. Right, so it, it, this always provokes angry reactions from database administrators who are like, call me when you can join two tables together, call me when I can run Power BI against it, or whatever. It is the future for value. This is going to sound like I'm, I'm being sarcastic, but I'm not. It's the future for data that you don't care that passionately about when you don't really care about consistency levels, relational keys, triggers, things like that. It's fine if all you're doing is dumping date keys, keys and values in, and then you're pushing in a key and pulling back a value. MongoDB is totally fine. It's totally okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I am a huge fan of other data platforms to store data that really shouldn't have ever been in SQL Server in the first place. SQL Server's not expensive. It, it's true. It's not like investment data banks are known for their good decisions anyway, right? Let's see. What's up? Uh, let's see here. Go through. There were a couple of other questions. Oh, I think I've hit them all. Um, oh, um, so Atreon X uh, says, since we're on Twitch, don't have a schedule, just try to be live as much as possible. And it, this isn't a question, but I just wanted to point it out because it's kind of fun to share. So the whole reason that I stream isn't that I'm trying to build up and become the next ninja. You know, it's not like I'm trying to go uh, be... Uh, you know, massively famous on Twitch, because I don't make any money on Twitch. You know, I make money on sponsorships, which I'll talk about here in a second, but this is stand-up comedy, yeah, uh, kind of. Um, but it, it, uh, I just do it really to give back to y'all to help answer questions and answers because my time between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. Pacific on the weekend is kind of open anyway. So, But if I wanted to be popular, I would do it during more mainstream weekday uh, hours. I work. I work then I have a job. You probably know what that's like because you have a job too. Um, and then uh, also in here, uh, Botsko says, I have devs constantly asking me why we can't look at NoSQL options for our databases. I've given them the talk about transactional performance, etc. What's your take? Uh, what's your take on this? I love NoSQL options for our databases, and we use them. I'll give you a great example. So if you go to paste the plan pasetheplan.com, or if you just search for paste the plan, this is where you can pass uh, execution plans into here. So let's go do one real quick. I'll just say select star from sys databases. I'll go get an execution plan. And then I'm going to right click in here. I'm going to say, show me the execution plan. If I wanted to save this with a friend, I'd copy it, go over to paste the plan, paste it, and hit submit. Now I get a URL that I can share with, watch it not work, which would be really funny. Uh, I get a URL that I can share with other people. And then I get a visualization of my query plan right here inside the browser. So what this is useful for is if you need to share an execution plan for tuning queries with someone else, I don't. this doesn't need to be in a relational database. There's no need for that. All we have is a key, which is that key right there off of the URL, and then a value, which is the XML contents of the execution plan. So I'm totally okay with not using a relational database for that. It just doesn't make sense. So I'm, I'm a huge fan. If your developers are asking to use uh, NoSQL, be like, sure, what kind of thing do you want to use it for? 
and recognize that if they're just storing a key and a value and then fetching back the key, NoSQL's totally legit. I'm never going to query across this data. I'm not going to use it for reporting. I don't have a centralized dashboard that uh, lists out all of the query plans and lets people pick. If you don't have that key, you ain't getting the value back. It's just that simple. I don't really care if we lose data. You heard me. I don't care if we lose your execution plans. Life goes on. I mean, I've, I've got backups set up. Richie's got backups in there uh, set up for uh, our DynamoDB and whatnot. But I, I, it's not like I need every minute to consistency on that. So it's kind of neat. Uh, so shout out to this week's sponsor. So this week's sponsor is Column Score. If you've got a uh, database and tables where you're thinking about implementing column store indexes, you can go over to columnscore.com and take a seven question quiz to figure out whether or not column store indexes in SQL Server make sense for you. So that's columnscore.com. We'll give you your column score on what percentage likely it is that your table will do well inside SQL server. So let's see here what else we got inside the queue. Let's go pull some of those onto do 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 come copy some of this stuff into here. Uh, copy that and do 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 do. All right, there we go. Now let's get the YouTube stuff off from DB Wizardry. Looks like he has one or she. Let's see from YouTube. Copy that over. And then we'll copy this over. Copy from YouTube. Paste. And then come out over there. And copy and paste from YouTube. Paste. There we go. All right, we got a few in there, and now let's go back to the next one. So let's see here. For the next one, let's pick. Uh, what he says is the XP command shell disabled by default for, it's always been disabled. Uh, you have to enable it if you want it. Um, it says that command is a huge problem in the context of SQL injections. No, not really, because anybody who gets sysadmin permissions, they can turn it on anyway. So if somebody gets to the point where they can run XP command shell, they've probably also gotten to the point where they can turn XP command shell off and on. So uh, Jesus says, can you please tell when we compress a table? When, when do we compress a table? So if you want to do compression, I would look at column store indexes instead, because SQL Server's page and row compression just isn't really all that good compared to column store indexes. Column store indexes are much better. That cranky older gentleman is absolutely correct there. Um, next up, K the Blade Runner says, nice selection for an avatar pick there. I currently work on a Windows app with SQL Server as a database. Do you recommend using stored procedures or queries in code? Oh, I have a blog post about that. I'll show you. So I'm going to search for stored procedures uh, in app code site brenozar.com because I can't remember what the exact title is. That's it right there. Should we use stored procedures or queries built into the app? And what it generally comes down to is, are you better at version control in the database or are you better at version control in the app? And when you have a performance emergency, would you rather just have a database expert tweak a stored procedure and go live? Or would you rather recompile your app and ship a new version of the app? I'll give you an example. Worked with a website for a football team, very popular football team in the United States. And as they started winning more games, they started running into problems where the database server would fall over. Because every time they'd win a game, everyone wants to buy a jersey. They can't buy jerseys if the website's down. Now, thankfully, all of their database code was in stored procedures. So I was able to identify the one stored procedure, make a quick change to it, hit execute, and immediately their website stayed up. They could sell millions of dollars of jerseys in a weekend. If we had, to, had had that exact same data logic inside the app, we would have had to change the app, redeploy it, push it out across all their web servers. And if we would have even been able to do that, which we weren't because they were in the midst of building a new version of their app, even if we were able to do that, it would have been hours worth of work in order to get there. I was able to get there in like, 10 minutes tops. Next up, let's go see what we got next. 
Uh, Nicole, let's copy paste that out, put that into the log from YouTube, put that over, over there. Yohor says, does it make sense to store uh, Envercare Max in a separate table? Uh, that's more of a data modeling question, and I don't usually get involved in data modeling just because people have already broken their applications by the time they get me involved. Go get a book on data modeling instead. Uh, Eric says, best approach to feed raw data into a SQL Server? Generally, whatever t uh, app your team is the most comfortable with, C Sharp, Java, SSIS, Azure Data Factory, whatever you've got the most people to support, because once you start feeding raw data into SQL Server, you're going to be working a lot on that business logic. You want to choose a tool that you're very comfortable with. If you're not comfortable with any tools at all, then that's where you start asking a bigger architectural type decision. Uh, let's see here. Copy paste a couple of things into there. Um, do 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 do. That goes in. That goes in. That goes in. And that goes in. All right. So let's see here. Geos asks a BI colleague of mine loads fact tables as heaps, and instead of bothering to understand, just transforms a heap into clustered column store. How bad is that kind of approach? That's actually Microsoft's fast track data warehouse reference architecture design. They actually want you to use clustered column store inside data warehouses. It's not that bad at all. It's actually very common. So what you might be, you might not have gone to any data warehouse training in the last. I'm going to say six years, because this technique has become the, the de facto standard across the last six years as Column Store became better. Adam nails it. Column Stores are great if you don't update your data there. Next up, from YouTube, a friend of mine asks why Clippy decide to put the inequality column. Um, and da -da 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 -da. so that I cover that in my fundamentals of index tuning class. Watch my fundamentals of index tuning class, and I uh, go there. So A middle says, and I'm going to put that up there because we're talking about compression. A middle says, I use page compression in a lot of places and it's a godsend. Really helps my performance and speed up any reads from disk. We have tables from 100 million to 1.5 billion rows, rows, and I swear by it, it's worth a CPU hit. So often though, when I run into folks, they're still not happy with query performance. Ask yourself the honest question of, are users happy or are they tolerating it? Like performance used to really suck, and then you put in page compression, and it hardly sucks at all. And your users are like, golf clap. OK, great. Well, you, And they're trying to make you feel better by saying it hardly sucks at all. But it's still nowhere near the level of performance that you get with real compression, which is like 70, 80, 90%. That's what column store index does. Next up, uh, from YouTube, any advice on choosing data warehouse gear between Azure SQL DB and Column Store, analysis services, da, 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 so many choices. It changes continuously. It changes all the time based on what different vendors are shipping, what, uh, what your executives are choosing to do in terms of which cloud platform you go on. So what I'll usually say is before we choose a tool, Let's talk to executives and which cloud are we going to be in for the next five to ten years? Are we going to be in Microsoft's, Amazon's, Google's, or someone else's? You know, you tell me which cloud we're standardizing on, and then based on that, that influences which choice you end up using. So that, that just is your first part in ruling out those. Then the second thing that I would ask is, for the the cloud options on the for the data warehouse options on the cloud vendor you went with, look for a roadmap that's like two, three, four years long for the products that are out there. For example, if you decide on the Azure cloud, you go, okay, so let's look at the roadmap for the next several years for each of the uh, uh, data warehouse products that they have out there. For example, if you look at Microsoft, you may also want to look in the rearview mirror because I swear to God, they've changed the product names every six weeks. It's like, today its name is Her Hermes. Okay, tomorrow his name is Sheila. You know, it's, just, it's insane how they're just squirrel continuously. So I want to pick something that's kind of stable that I know I'm going to be able to bet my business on for the next several years. 
and I, I'm talking crap about uh, Azure's uh, Synapse, Synapse Analytics Pamela or whatever it is that they're calling it these days. The technology is really awesome. I just wish that they would pick a plan and kind of stick with it. Uh, Geoserm says Tabular uses Vertipack engine that compresses data per column. Correct. That's column store indexes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's copy paste a couple of more questions over there from YouTube and keep going there from YouTube. The same thing, Botsco, it's the same thing with the documentation too as well. It gets it uh, a little tricky. All right, copy these into here and do, do, do here and here and anything else I think. That goes, there we go. All right, so next up from YouTube, I work in a managed service, but I'm limited as to what I can learn because I, limited to what I can learn is I always require customer approval and cost. Would you say that working for an actual company is better? Every, so I'm gonna give you the, instead of that, I'm gonna answer a different question because it'll help you understand what your question is. What's better, working for a small company or a big company? In a big company, you have to go through five layers of approval to get anything that you want. You got to get approval from Phyllis and finance and Bob and sales and your three middle level managers. You got to get all this approval. The company moves really slow. But as a result, when you adopt technology, the technology has been out for like 40 years. Nothing changes. You see everything coming a mile in advance. It's really stable. Sure, you might get laid off at any given moment in time. You know, that's always true anywhere. But it tends to be a lot more stable and you see things coming down the pike. Uh, you also have a lot of coworkers to learn from. You're not on call 24-7. You're in a rotation with other people. You have senior people and junior people. On the flip side, on a small uh, company, you may be the only data person and you may wear other hats as well. You may be able to walk into the company owner's office and tell them you need $5,000 for whatever, and you might be able to get it just based on your own personal credibility. There's not a lot of red tape in small companies. So it's the same kind of thing with whatever industry you pick. It's more about what you like to do personally. I know that I can never work for another big company again. I hate big companies. I hate bureaucracy. If I go to work as a, as a database administrator again, it would be for a very small startup where I can kind of rule with an iron fist, where I can know everybody inside the company. CTI Geek says, I worked at a Fortune 500 company, worked for a startup, now work for, worked for a sweet spot, and it works for you. For me, a 5,000 company employee sucks, to, or a 5,000 employee company sucks too. But that's just me. It's all, all of us are different in what we like. I'm the kind of person who likes to now these days work for myself, and I pity the person who tries to hire me uh, after that. Next up from YouTube, can we use T-SQL programming for string matching and pattern matching? You can, but SQL Server at $2,000 a core for standard edition is a really crappy way to do that. And absolutely, you can use reg regex with uh, CLR, but if you're going to do .NET code, why would you spend $2,000 a core to run? That's like saying, well, I would like to use .NET code, but I'm going to run it on my phone. That way, because it's SQL Server licensing, I'm going to pay $8,000 worth of licensing for my phone. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to pay that kind of licensing to run CLR code. So if you have application needs, do that in an application. If you just need to store data, that's a, that's a, a, a database, the base for your data. But if you want to do things with the data, like shred strings or build XML or HTML or CSS or AJAX or whatever, that's that's the application server. Um, next up, Malik says, any good resources for high availability and disaster recovery? So the problem is that HA and DR options keep changing constantly. Every new version of SQL Server, they're bringing out new options, they're changing the way the old options work. And what I always tell clients is every version that you go to, you should assume that all the HA and DR stuff is deprecated. Start again with every version that you go to. Because of that, there's no real ROI in writing training material for it, so you're not going to see a lot of good resources for high availability and disaster recovery that are on current versions. It's easy to find stuff that's like three, four, five versions back because they, they paid off long enough. 
But these are modern ones, it's not outside of books online that you really want to start by. I know this is going to sound weird, but reading the documentation. Oh my God, I know. Uh, let's see here. Next up we have, not that ABA you're looking for says, uh, we use Microsoft in Division, uh, so no code changes are possible, and it keeps getting deadlocks between two tables. Is there anything that can be done without code alterations? Yes, index tuning and changing the uh, uh, solid state drives for your tempdb. Tempdb needs to be extremely fast with Navision, because if I remember right, it uses RCSI or snapshot isolation, uh, which keeps all of the changes from the versions inside tempdb. I've seen situations where people were trying to run Navision's tempdb on like hard drives still, and they're so slow that the version store was causing deadlocks. So between the tempdb and the uh, indexing on the tables, those are the two big shots for NAV. Uh, SP Help DBA says, how can we correlate queries or statements from a batch or stored procedures easily from the uh, SQL cache plan? SP Blitz Cache. So check out SP Blitz Cache. That is a stored procedure. It's totally open source, a part of our first responder kit. And I teach you how to use it in our how I use the first responder kit training classes too. Ernesto asks, what's the best approach to deal with date and time data? When you say deal with, be more specific. Like I need to know what it is that you're trying to do. Because uh, I don't know if you're filtering on stuff. What, what specifically is the problem that you're trying to solve? When you're saying deal with, I don't know if you just mean you're looking for liquor recommendations or if you want a therapist or what it is that you want. But uh, tell me what you're trying to accomplish and we'll go from there. Uh, CTI Geek says, does your keyboard blink and flash like that all the time? No, I actually only turn it on for the webcasts. There's a button you can just turn the animations on and off with. But some people aren't that bright who watch the uh, webcasts. They need something flashing to distract them, like a cat with a, a laser pointer. Like you, I suppose, because you're the one who noticed that. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, next up, CTI Geek Labs. Uh, let's see here. Farshid says, when do you conclude that there is no room for database performance tuning? For example, the issue is hardware limits in terms of memory, I.O., etc. Do TPC benchmarks help with us in that regard? No, because TPC benchmarks are somebody else's code, so they don't really have anything to do with the code that your users are trying to run. Those things are pretty useless. Um, when I conclude that there's no room for database performance tuning, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, oh, so the issue is hardware limits. Oh, I'll give you a great example. Um, so one of my clients does one-by-one -one inserts, inserts rows one at a time, and they need to ingest millions of rows per minute. Like they're trying to pull in, say, 2 million rows per minute, and they're inserting them one at a time. And they insert one row, wait to get the confirmation back from SQL Server before they insert the next row. Well, in order to prove that hardware was the problem, we tried, for example, taking the same amount of data and doing a batch insert in. And I said, look, if we changed your code, we could insert 2 million rows in 10 seconds. It's not really that hard. But because of the way that your code works, putting in one row at a time, we're having to deal with the latency on the log file. And we showed how turning off delayed durability made that go away, made their application go faster. So it comes down to the specific bottleneck that we're trying trying to face and then trying to change the code in a way that it wouldn't hit that bottleneck and giving the client the choice between would you rather fix your code or would you rather go get faster hardware and I don't care what the answer is I'm fine either way because some companies love to throw people at a problem some companies love to throw hardware at a problem like you'll see one exhausted database administrator sweat pouring off her face but she's got 60 SQL servers that all have two terabytes of RAM you know, so it's just on which way people like to spend money. Uh, Tiago, you could, you could, you could maybe search for that. There are sites called Google or Bing that you might use. I support alternative lifestyles. Tiago, you just got yourself a ban, so you are now uh, blocked. So you're out of here. All right. Uh, next up, let's copy paste a couple of the questions. 
uh, over from, I know, I rule with an iron fist from YouTube. <laughs> Saki says, I love your, uh, sequ your uh, sarcastic comments. Um, let's see, I, uh, IT and Stuff asked, are there any SQL Server tool suggestions for everyday use? I just use Management Studio. That's uh, usually fine for me. BJ says, how is Snowflake? I haven't actually used it, so you got me there. Uh, so let's copy paste a couple others into here and do tube and paste that. Uh, Cultivart says, did you really just ban, ban Tiago? I banned his comments from showing up inside here, which is, I don't mind if he stays around in the channel, but I just don't want all that crap coming up all the time on y'all's uh, question feed. Um, so let's go copy all, I, I have no tolerance for crap like that. Uh, copy paste those in, copy paste, copy paste, copy paste. Copy. <laughs> Drop table employee says, uh, come for the database Q&A, stay for the zings. I agree. There we go. All right. So copy all of these. All right. Now let's start putting them in. Uh, Ganesh says, have you ever done consultation for Microsoft? Yes. Uh, I uh, was part of the team that built the last Microsoft certified master exam, for example, after I passed it uh, and then went in and did consultation for Microsoft. But you know what the funny thing was is that the billable rate wasn't that good. That Microsoft's billable rate wasn't as good as what I could get just working directly with the public. So I stopped working for Microsoft just because really at the end of the day, I work to live. I don't live to work. Like I, I want to work as crazy as it sounds. I want to work as, as little as possible. I love what I do, but I'd rather get drunk and read Wikipedia and watch Big Brother. I have really bad taste in television. So, uh, so yeah, so I don't do any consultant consultation for Microsoft anymore just because the billable rates aren't that good. Honestly, it's true for most large companies. If you want to work for a big, ginormous company, generally the consulting rates aren't that good compared to what you can get working with startups, you know, who are facing an urgent problem. So is the guy streaming at 6 a.m.? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, because I'm going to be up anyway. So I'm kind of like, eh. Uh, from YouTube, where do I learn and get used to monitoring solutions? It, this is going to sound like I'm being sarcastic, but seriously, the vendor's documentation. The vendors are the only ones who are going to write documentation for that. No third-party person is going to write a tutorial on how to use Orion or Spotlight. It just wouldn't make sense. All right, so and Saki Talib says, get drunk and weed, read Wikipedia uh, are two phrases that I thought I'd never hear uh, together. Um, Zaki says, where's Surly Dev? He's not in, he's totally a volunteer. So I'm like, whenever he shows up, I'm always wonderfully blessed. All right, so we'll stop here and take a five minute bio break. We have a bunch of questions in the queue. And when we come back, I'll keep digging through the queue. So five minute bio break, go refill your espresso. And I will see y'all back here shortly. <laughs>
right, welcome back. The sun is starting to shine here in downtown San Diego. See what we got next here in terms of our question queue. Uh, so next up, GeoCerm says, then what's the better approach to a preparing a fact table with column store? Should I first load the data into heap and transform it into a column store or directly write the table as a column store? It's actually neither. If you want to get segment elimination, what you need to do is load it put a clustered index based on the column that you want segment elimination, then load the column store index from there. I actually teach you why and how to do it in my new class, Fundamentals of Column Store Indexes. So that's free and included with anyone who has a live class season pass. And for those of you who have a recorded class season, oh, excuse me, recorded class season pass, you can watch the recordings of it of the first class after, I want to say it's like next Tuesday or Wednesday is the very first one. Uh, but it's a, such a good question, and the answer, it actually takes me as we go through the class, it's like the fifth or sixth module by the time I get to that, and then all of a sudden it understands, you're like, oh, now I get what segment elimination is, now I understand why partitioning is important and things like that. Uh, Raymond, welcome to the club. It's like Rain Man, but different. Also, any of you who want notifications whenever my streams start, you can subscribe to me on the streaming platform you're looking at, whether you're watching Twitch, YouTube, whatever. Uh, next up, uh, Geoserm says, sadly, I'm from the EU. Yep, yeah, unfortunately, I don't know of a good uh, class over there. Uh, Ernesto says, we need to have a report that orders by date time. We use get date to read from the server, but we show it in local time wherever the user is located. What's your advice? Do the date conversion, like converting it to local time on the web server or reporting server. Don't use SQL Server's expensive CPU cycles to do things like change date column formats. It just doesn't really make sense. Next up from YouTube, we have too many SQL Server users dumping data into Excel with a SQL Server connection. Will it impact performance doing it that way as opposed to pulling it from Management Studio? What I would worry about is how much data are they really pulling? Exactly, Adam, yes. How much data are they re how much data are they really pulling back? Is it millions of rows? If it's millions of rows, both Excel and Management Studio are going to suck at pulling down that much data. But if it's not millions of rows, I don't really care. It's not really that big of a deal. Next up, uh, Ferner asks, is TempDB a big bottleneck on SQL Server in your opinion? You know it used to be? It used to be a really big problem before people really widely understood that you need to create multiple TempDB files. So that solved it for a while. Then the next bottleneck became everybody started loving using TempDB again. The next big bottleneck uh, hit and was fixed when SQL Server decided to keep stuff in TempDB and RAM rather than write it out quickly. In one of the 2012 cumulative updates, SQL Server 2012, Microsoft realized that they could just keep stuff in memory as long as possible and only put it to push it to disk when we were running into memory problems. So these days, it's fairly unusual for me to see as the biggest bottleneck. I'm just, I'm just going to dump out the, off the top of my head the top weight stats that we see from constant care. Usually, bad parallelism CPU using queries and being unable to cache data from disk, those are the three big issues that I usually see out there on C uh, 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 Column Store. Or on, not on Column Store, I'm still thinking Column Store from the other one, uh, on uh, SQL servers out there. Now, several of you are asking back and forth, are doing troubleshooting on uh, a, a two-column date problem, and I love that you're trying to hash it out here. Unfortunately, what you're pursuing is not the right answer. Now, the tough thing is, for me to get you the right answer, I'm going to post that question because I think I have it, yeah, right here, A middles. Um, the, any tips on how to, to more efficiently locate records that are between two different dates where the dates are in two different columns, so like a start date and an end date. This sucks, and we talk about it a little in Fundamentals of Query Tuning. The Fundamentals of Query Tuning class, I dig into that, but it is genuinely hard work. Uh, no, abuse sysadmin, let's not uh, give folks as to how tips on how to get out of uh, GDPR issues. I appreciate your uh, understanding on that one. I'd really like to keep my business and not, not lose my business to some buttholes from the EU. And I don't mean that by y'all. I mean the government. 
Um, Zachy says, what do you think about using databases like DynamoDB to cache data? Dynamo is a really crappy caching tool because it has to be persisted to disk. If you want to use as a cache, check out Redis. R-E-D-I-S. Redis is a much better caching solution than DynamoDB. Dynamo is better if you need to persist the data to disk permanently. Redis is better if you don't mind walking away from the data if the Redis cluster crashes. You can configure Redis in a way that it'll persist the stuff to disk, just most people don't. Most people just use it as a purely in-memory caching solution. Atik says, please share your thoughts on polybase and containers for a transactional environment. That's just not the, the problem that polybase and containers were designed to solve. Uh, they're much more better suited for big data uh, solutions where you have data scattered across all kinds of sources and you need to query them all into one place from time to time. But transactional stuff is small inserts, updates, and deletes, store my shopping cart, pull my shopping cart out, place an order, see what the status of my order is. These are very narrow, short queries. Polybasin containers just get in the way. They're not really related, which is always kind of frustrating when I deal with Microsoft marketing. You know, you see them up at uh, on stage and they're like, this feature is good for everyone. Try it today. And I'm like, uh, n it, n no, no, no. I, I get that you're just trying to get adoption for that feature, but it, it just doesn't make any sense. Jan asks an interesting question. Jan says, uh, are there any tools like Pace the Plan for blocking uh, deadlock graphs? No, I'm not aware of one where you can upload a deadlock graph and then render it. And that isn't something that we would go and pursue because it's so much smaller of the population. So I, I would probably just paste it to like paste bin. If you search for paste bin, that's a place where you can just copy paste stuff in. It's not going to render visually, but... Next up, uh, from YouTube, what's the best way to design API endpoint calls to a stored procedure that does searching? I don't do any development work at all. Like, I don't do C Sharp, Java. I got, I, I'm kind of old. The last development I did was around 2003, 4, 5, where I was playing around with classic VB script. Makes it sound like it was ever any good. It was not. Uh, it's C Sharp, Java, and I just haven't touched it since then because I realized I really hate debugging. I have so much respect for developers. Developers are just unbelievable heroes in my eyes because they have to put up with so much debugging stuff. All of a sudden my watch vibrated. It's time to wash. No, it's not. Just because some of your questions are dirty, that doesn't mean I need to wash my hands. Um, so much respect for developers who have to deal with debugging things across platforms, up in the cloud, serverless type stuff. It's just amazing how hard development work is and how easy database work is in comparison. Databases haven't really changed that much in the last 20 years. Sure, they keep adding features, and you can choose to whether you use those features or not. But really, at the end of the day, it's the same language, which makes your life pretty easy. Uh, Frescani says, in terms of licensing, is SQL Server Express viable for managing a company data mart? No, for a couple of reasons. One is that Express is limited to like 10 gigs or 50 gigs. I can never remember 10 gigs or 50 gigs per database, which usually isn't large enough for a data mart. And two, SQL Express is limited to just one CPU core and one gig of RAM. Frascani says 10, yeah. Uh, so one CPU core and one gig of RAM. I don't know a lot of data mark queries that could run on less power than a phone has. So I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of SQL Express for that. Uh, let's see here. Next up, we had a couple of them coming from YouTube. Let me copy paste those over into this from YouTube. And there we go. And was that other? Oh, there was another good one from Lieven. So we'll copy that over and go there. And let's go put those up in the chat. So next up is, oh, I got to put them over here. Add this here and this. And then here. So from YouTube, uh, do you advise customers to upgrade as soon as the new SQL Server version comes out? Not no, but hell no. Um, when you go to a new version of something, go because you have to go, not because you want to go. 
let other people find the bugs first. The bugs in the first couple few cumulative updates are usually horrifying. So out of the first, Adam says it's like buying a new car, except I, I can't usually hold back because the first year is just utterly amazing. But that's true. Um, the, the first couple of cumulative updates, if I remember right, out of the first three cumulative updates for SQL Server 2019, two of the three fixed corruption bugs. So I, it, at this point, I, I, I've been struggling about how I felt about recommending when people to move to SQL Server 2019. And as the cumulative updates have been coming out, I have been getting less and less interested in going to SQL Server 2019. And for me, the straw that broke the camel's back was cumulative update seven. I was complaining, yeah, it was more than last week, it was a few weeks ago, but like, I was complaining like crazy about the quality of cumulative updates. Microsoft is now writing like one line, here's what the fix does, and they're not documenting in depth. And we can't, uh, Yahoo, let's not ask again. Let's not uh, post second questions. If you post this a third time, I'm going to ban you from the channel. Thank you for understanding. Um, I'll get to it, just not there yet. Uh, so uh, when CU7 came out, I had been complaining for a long time about stop just putting out one sentence, fix, sentence, sentence descriptions of what fixes are. Tell us what's broken so we can make decisions about what, how quickly we need to patch this CU. Are the fixes in there relevant to what we're doing? And I had been ranting and raving about it on SQLServerUpdates.com, which is another site uh, that I manage, lists out all the updates and tells you which ones to apply. And after CU7, CU7, they actually pull back and they said, attention, everyone who's using it, we need you to uninstall that right away. And a bunch of us are like, why? What's it do? What's the bug that we need to watch out for? And it's not that we don't want to uninstall it, but we got to go to management and say, uh, excuse me, everyone, we need to take production down in order to, you know, I, I don't know why we need to do this. Microsoft won't tell me. They, they just said that I should take a production outage immediately. I got people who run hospitals. I got people who run all kinds of things that are uh, absolutely mission critical, and they have to plan for outages like 21, 30 days in advance. So when they wouldn't even tell us what was broken inside of there, but was so important that Microsoft, a global company, would tell you to yank it from production immediately and uninstall it, I'm like, that's BS. And then Cumulative Update 8 came out, and they didn't tell us what was fixed. They didn't tell us in the KB article that the stuff that was broken in 7 that demanded an uninstall, they didn't tell us that that was actually fixed or not. And I had to post a blog post going, excuse me, Microsoft, can you at least say that what you had broken in CU7 is now fixed? Then they updated the CU8 release notes. So here's the deal. I'm at the point where I'm trying to decide whether I post a blog post over on Brenozar.com, because there's like 100,000 subscribers on Brenozar.com, and I know when I post something up there, the poop's going to hit the fan. But I'm trying to decide when the point is where I post up there, I'm sorry, folks, I'm done recommending SQL Server 2019 until Microsoft get its, gets its poop together. If they can't tell us what they're breaking and fixing, I don't recommend that you go to it, because the risk just isn't worth it. Now, I can say that here on the screen because there are 108 of y'all in Twitch. There are however many there else there are over in YouTube. And it's not like I'm doing it to 100,000 people. Y'all are kind of in the insiders club. I kind of think of y'all as like my friends and neighbors and all that. My coworkers, really, is the way I think about it. Um, so I can kind of tell you this kind of jokingly in confidentiality. <laughs> I know, right? I get pissed. I get pissed at like something that costs $7,000 a CPU core. And the, no the notes for a patch are like bug fixes and improvements. Oh, I, oh, sorry, we need you to take down production to uninstall bug fixes and improvements. I'm like, that's BS. That's ridiculous. I'd, I'd get fired if I tried a stunt like that in any kind of modern company. Um, so I get really pissed off about that. And I, I'm getting to the point where I need to post a blog post on Renozar.com. But at the same time, that well, I know when I do, I'm going to start a firestorm. Because people think of me as really... And yeah, Adam says that's why I like, like working in the BI space, just reload the data if it's, it gets corrupted. And the other thing when the BI space is, nobody really believes the numbers in the reports anyway. 
The numbers could all be wrong. The executives are making bad decisions regardless of what numbers you put up in front of them on the report. It's not like somebody's going to die. Nobody's using Power BI to dispense patient medications. You know, it's not like they're using radiological therapy based on what comes out of Power BI. I love Power BI, it's fantastic, but it's not like people are using it for that purpose. SQL Server, they actually are, and we're having incorrect results bugs. That's why I, where I start to lose my mind. Uh, so there's that question. I answered the holy heck out of that one. Uh, Bob says, never install CU2. I agree with that as well. Uh, so let's throw a couple of the other questions in there. Let's copy paste that in. And there was one other. Oh, no, yeah, there were a couple other. Here we go. Josue had one from YouTube. Uh, tube, paste that in. And uh, Yahor asked a second time. He's been wonderfully patient, so I should probably. He yes, hasn't really been wonderfully patient. Uh, but I should probably answer his one first. Uh, so that got, that caught up everything there on Twitter, on, copied it over to Twitch. And let's put these into the queue. Uh, to do, 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 do. So we got all that. All right, perfect. So where was Yahors? Yahors was, there we go. Um, uh, Manny, I teach that one in my classes. If you go to Fundamentals of Index Tuning, Fundamentals of Index Tuning and Mastering Index Tuning, I teach that over in those classes. Um, uh, so Yahor said, uh, how do you think Postgres uh, stacks up to SQL Server relative to OLTP trend, uh, scenarios? I think it's really good. I think most of what most people need is in Postgres for transactional stuff. Now, where it gets a little tricky is what's your compliance needs? Like, do you need to audit? And I'll give you a great example to clients of mine who are hospitals. If you want to be HIPAA compliant, what you need to do is you need to track everyone in your company and what they see. Like if someone runs a select query to look at George Clooney's healthcare records, you want to track which nurses and doctors saw George Clooney's health records so that when someone sells them to TMZ, you know who did it and you can go track that down to fix your HIPAA violations. That kind of thing is more challenging with Postgres because SQL Server has been around longer. They have more enterprise features, more compliance features, more security features. So it's easier to do those kinds of things with SQL Server than it is with Postgres. But if you're just talking about running a website that just sells stuff, Postgres does a pretty good uh, job of that. I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, next up uh, from YouTube, uh, share your thoughts on indexing inline table valued functions. You don't have to. There's no difference between those in a regular T-SQL query. It's the same exact indexing approach. Um, the best approach for partition switching for larger fact tables, there's only one approach to partition switching. It's the sliding window load scenario. So that one is the one that you want. Uh, next up uh, from YouTube, what's a good performance? tuning book you would recommend. Oh, I have a whole uh, article with my list of favorite links. I'll give them to you. So let's go to brentozar.com slash go slash books. If I go to brentozar.com slash go slash books, B-O-O-K-S, it's got my recommended list of SQL Server books, and I update this usually like once a year to give you a rough idea of what my favorite books are uh, there. And then I've got links to Amazon, other places where you can go buy them. So that's brentozar.com slash go slash books. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, let's see. Oh, Al Getty has an interesting question. Let me copy paste a couple of those out there from YouTube. There's that. Uh, and then copy. And from YouTube. Boom. Ask, put those over into the queue. And then we'll answer a couple more here. Put those in. Um, Hey Middle says, can you speak to those that hear what I say about SQL Server 2019 and point to the compatibility level as a workaround? The problem is that compatibility level doesn't fix bugs in the engine. Remember how I said that two out of the three first cumulative updates fixed corruption bugs? Didn't matter what your cumulative update was, you get corruption, you're getting corruption. Has nothing to do with compat level, so I'm not interesting in there. 
Ah, ha, ha. Oh, funny, Surly Dev. Oh, welcome to the club. A geocacher undo a Chinese puzzle. I think geocaching is so interesting. I don't do it. It's, it, I don't, I don't like going outside. Uh, but I, I think it's really interesting in terms of uh, uh, that whole as a hobby. Uh, Tiago says, oh, and that's Surly Dev. Oh, nailed that. Thank you, Surly Dev. Uh, also, I should say a warm round of applause for what most viewers didn't catch there is that Surly Dev just showed up, who's our question moderator here at uh, the office hours. Uh, Tiago says, what do you think about secret clearances for DBAs? If you're going to work in government field, it helps you get more jobs. Uh, if you're going to work in as a contractor for in the Washington, D.C. area, in the Virginia area, then it can help you get a lot more jobs faster. If you, just as a, as a general personal advice, if you ever get the chance to get secret, uh, or if you should get any kind of uh, consulting or any kind of government secrecy clearance, you should probably get it. Go for it because it will open up additional uh, options to you for your career that you didn't have before. People have lower standards for taking people into secret clearance jobs. If you have the secret clearance, you're more likely to get a job that you're not even qualified for, which is kind of cool. Uh, and then from YouTube, this is kind of interesting. What advice would you say to Brent of the past, to Brent of the present about learning SQL? I always have a tough time changing uh, my career. Like I love where I'm at today. I'm ridiculously lucky. Um, I work less than anybody I know. It feels like I know it looks like to y'all I work a lot because I show up here at odd hours, but I do not work that hard. Um, the, so I would be, t and I'm, I'm successful, I'm happy, I'm fulfilled, I love what I do, I'm having a killer time. I, I don't feel like I would go through a, a midlife crisis or anything like that, because I'm just having way too good of a time. I feel like I'm a child again already half the time. Real drunken, gray-haired child. Um, but what would I tell my past self? One thing that I would tell myself is I wouldn't waste time going deep on a uh, VMware, AWS, uh, backups, check DB, the things that you do to keep SQL servers lights on, the things to keep it up and running, because being on call and being good at being on call, I don't find fulfilling. I would rather not be on call. I would rather not have my phone ring. I like being drunk. We've talked about that before. I'm not an alcoholic by any means, but I, I do come from a family of alcohol. I, I really come from two families of alcoholics on both sides of my tree. Um, I, but I feel like I have it under control. I'm not, I joke a lot about quarantine alcoholics or whatever, but I don't want to be on call. I want to be able to disconnect and not have to look at my phone. So I think w I wish I would have had that realization earlier in my career. Don't get good at troubleshooting uptime. Get good at something else that pays you a lot. It, I didn't go down this route, but another route, if you were thinking about it, business intelligence, architecture, uh, 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 application architecture, uh, performance tuning, of course, is the route that I chose going back. That, that's abs Adam's absolutely true. I've always, he says, I've found in my work that business understanding has helped me gain more in giving users what they want than in the technical knowledge. I often tell people that don't worry about learning more tech if you think that's holding you back. You have Google for that. You can get Google, you can go to YouTube, you can learn almost anything. One of my favorite examples is Grimes, the musical artist, Claire Boucher, I think her last name is. Uh, but she's taught herself everything that she knows about production and musical instruments and playing and all that just through YouTube, through, through, through free videos. You want to learn more about your audience, what it is that your business users want. That's the thing that helps you succeed rather than the technical stuff. The technical stuff you can do just in time learning from all over the place when you need to learn it. So there you go. Uh, uh, TG says, you will also want to comp TIA Security Plus to get DOD jobs. And what I would say is, if you're in Virginia and the DC area, those are the kinds of things that matter. Yes, uh, Elon Musk's wife, which I was very disappointed when that happened because I'm like, no, he's not good for you. He's, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. He's just, it, uh, it's a terrible pairing. But, and then it's later, I'm like, actually, they're actually not a bad pairing. They're actually kind of crazy in the right kind of ways. So I kind of like it. Uh, from YouTube, we're on SQL Server 2016 with production. Does it make sense to start upgrading to 2017 or is 2016 fine for now? Change 
equals risk. Whenever you change something, you are risking. You're risking that things are actually going to go right, and you're also taking your time to do it. So the only time that I would go is when you're having a problem. When you're having a problem and the solution involves SQL Server 2017. Otherwise, 2017 or 2016 is still under mainstream support. Works just fine. It's totally okay. Uh, my friend asks from over on YouTube, uh, Samani says, what's the difference between predicates and seek predicates? Oh, I forgot. I, we, uh, we covered that one in. I said, go hit my fundamentals of uh, index tuning class for that one. There we go. Uh, Zachy says, I have a friend who works in Lockheed Martin, and he had to go through a ton of background checks for working with the Air Force. I've been offered contracts like that, too. And, you know, as soon as they start um, uh, going through and do, saying, hey, Brent, we're going to need you to do all this security type clearance kind of work. I'm like, OK, and so what's the hourly rate again? The hourly rate sucks. Yeah, I'm not really interested in that. But for those of you who, who where that does make sense, then sure, by all means, go for it. But it is really hard. My wife went through that same kind of thing to become an air traffic controller and all kinds of stuff in the background. I have a dirty past, but whatever. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Juwan on YouTube says, what are some of the cool integrations you see with using Python and SQL Server? Oh, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. I'm going to get myself in very big trouble. I think it doesn't make sense to spend two to $7,000 a core to run Python in SQL Server. So the people I see that are doing cool things with Python in SQL Server, every time I've seen them do it, I've been like, have, have you scaled that up to production levels? And how much did that cost? And I get one of two answers. No, we didn't scale it up. It's only a proof of concept. Or two, my licensing was free meaning they didn't pay for it. They're either using developer edition or they're kind of skating by rules. So I haven't seen cool integrations that have scaled up and paid the actual price for SQL Server licensing. I believe they're out there. I believe somebody's doing something where the, the company just was like, screw it, have a forklift full of money. But otherwise, I'm like, if you're going to do Python work, it's open source. Just go run it somewhere that that doesn't charge a ton of money. Uh, uh, Sebastian, try pricing that out. Go run, go the pricing on it and go see how that works. Uh, next up, Fiker says, a friend found a suspect page on one of my user databases from MSDB after running CheckDB, no found. Open a support call. Anytime that you get a corruption event, immediately open a support call. Don't waste one minute of your life. Get on the phone. Do immediately open a support call. And I have a blog post about that actually too. If you go to brentozar.com slash go slash corrupt, so brentozar.com slash go slash corrupt. I have a post that tells you what to do when CheckDB reports corruption, and it walks you through the exact same checklist that I do with my own clients, just so that you can see. Next up, let's come back over here and see what we've got next. <laughs> Um, Nazar says, what are your thoughts on running SQL Server on Linux? Is it good enough for production? Let me show you something. Let's go see. So let's go over and check. What's the latest update for SQL Server? The latest update for SQL Server 2019 is Cumulative Update 8. So Cumulative Update 8. Let's go search for Linux on here. And it says in here, there are no SQL Server updates in here for CU8. How to obtain this thing for Linux? Can I get cumulative update 8? I huh. wonder why that is. Uh, I am not sure that I would really invest a lot when it's not even production equal yet, it doesn't have the same features. It's not getting the same level of attention. The day that Cumulative Update 8 even came out, it was like CU8 for Linux will be out at a future time. I'm like, eh, I don't really want to be a second class citizen here. 
Adam says the, the Linux thing always seemed like a marketing gimmick for me. It feels like it today. It's more of a just telling Oracle people, hey, if you don't like Windows and you want to migrate to SQL Server, you could run it on Linux too. You kind of have to be an idiot to do that, though. The troubleshooting and resources aren't there. The uh, documentation sucks. It's, that's kind of a tough call there. Uh, Ibeck says, can you please advise web resources where we can practice our T-SQL and performance skills with real life scenarios? Absolutely, my mastering classes. So in my mastering classes, I give you a live running workload with live queries running against the Stack Overflow database. And it's your responsibility to figure out the root cause of the bottleneck and tune it. Then you get to watch me do the same exact thing. So that's my mastering classes, mastering index tuning, mastering Mastering query tuning, mastering uh, parameter sniffing, and mastering server tuning. Next up, Ajit says, please suggest software for which checks database objects are correct syntactically. I don't even know what you mean. Maybe rephrase that question. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean correct syntactically. Um, let's see, Simon says, <laughs> Simon says, oh, that, uh, you, Simon, you probably get that all the time, and I just got it just by accident. I didn't think it was funny until I said it out loud, and then I was like, oh, geez, I just said Simon says. Mm. Uh, says, uh, sorry for asking, can I see the wait stats occurring during a specific query execution rather than a session level? Sure. Extended events. At, uh, with extended events, you can set up a session that will finish when a session completes and tell you, like, request by request, which wait stats it had. Another thing that you could do is you could look at the query's actual execution plan on recent versions of SQL Server, and the actual execution plan will show you wait stats. The problem is I, I don't really believe that they're accurate. They're kind of close to accurate, but not perfectly accurate. Get you kind of close, though. Uh, Bob the Lobster says, uh, from over in the UK, Bob says, you could run Linux Oracle on Windows, but why? Two wrongs don't make a right. That's a terrible thing, and I shouldn't say that. Uh, Adam says, I'm moving to 2019, but only for the analysis services stuff. That's where moving up in terms of versions makes a big difference. I think there are lots of features in SQL Server 2019 that I love. It's just that the quality control appears to have been done by a thousand monkeys bearing hammers that they were just randomly bashing around on accept buttons, not really paying attention to where the bugs were. I'm, I'm a huge fan of where it's going. I'm just not really that big of a fan of all the bugs that we're seeing uh, in there. But like I was when 2019 dropped, I was more excited about 2019 than I had been for a version probably since 2012. 20, 2012 was awesome in terms of just huge jumps up. 2016, awesome. I don't think quite as awesome as 2012 was, but it was, it was awesome as well. 2014, I give a rip. 2017, I don't really care that much either. 2019, I was like, oh, they're all in again. But then just like, oh my God, the quality control is just terrible. Um, uh, Tank says, what's your baseline for SQL Server versions with respect to only upgrading when you need to? Um, mainstream support. So for me, if you can't get support for Microsoft and you're running production things that like matter to people's lives, you know, you're dispensing medication, you're dealing with someone's uh, stock portfolio, you need to be in a situation where you can call Microsoft for support. Me as a consultant, I won't take calls for things that aren't that Microsoft won't take calls for. So my policy is if Microsoft can't support it, I don't really feel good trying to support it either. So, and I'll tell clients that. And they'll be like, well, will you help us get to a supported version? And I'm like, nope, I'll refer you to another uh, consultant and have you go through that work with them. I just won't risk my personal time on something that's unsupported. Just that's a personal preference. Uh, next up, Zachy says, Zachy's just asking the question for me from Stack Exchange. Very funny. I like that. So um, the only one, that, the only resource that I found was the one that's actually in my question about trace flag 2549. But I love that you asked that same question there. That was kind of funny. 
Uh, Avishek says, we're on SQL Server 2012, and my client is not to open SAS cubes on an Excel spreadsheet. What could it be the reason? Um, I have no idea. I actually don't use SAS. I do use Excel, but I don't use analysis services at all. Your best bet there would be to op ask it on a Q&A site like dba.stackexchange.com. There's not that I have anything against analysis services. I just pick my battles on which tools that I want to use there. Also, just as a side note, just in terms of professional advice, never, ever, 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 ever ask someone for help and say, my client, if you can avoid it, like sometimes I will just because everybody knows that I, I'm a consultant and I only have clients, but if you just say that I am unable to do that, and then that way people who are consultants may be more likely to give you help. Because sometimes consultants are like, I'm not going to solve your problem for free, which I, I wouldn't blame people for not answering my questions either. Also, I tend to ask really wacko hard questions. Now, just because I know how to Google first, that's all. It's not like I'm smart. Dennis says, what's a normal CPU on SQL Server and when is overloaded? I'll give you a great exa example from Stack Overflow. So if you follow Taron Pivots on Twitter, Taron Pivots is uh, SQL Server's DBA, or SQL Server is Stack Overflow's DBA, and she's brilliant. I have so much respect for her. Uh, so Taron will... It says time to wash again. It's not that's not that bad of a question. Um, so Taryn is Stack Overflow's DBA. And she'll post graphs from time to time on Stack Overflow's SQL servers. Stack Overflow tends to run around five percent, five to ten percent CPU utilization, because if their caching tier falls over, the SQL server has to be able to survive their workload even when the caching tier falls over. So for them, on day-to-day -day needs, if it goes beyond like 5-10%, it's probably time to upgrade the SQL server. Now that's an extreme case, but I'll give you another one. I got another one that only has one busy day per year. Just one busy day per year, and that's it. And for a few reasons, they can't run in the cloud. So for them, they run 1% CPU all year long, but then on that one day, we run you know, 60, 70, 80% CPU. So we don't mind going to a 64, 80 core SQL server, sits around all year idle, and then on that one day a year, it actually gets used. So that's why you don't usually see hard and fast numbers out there. Uh, TDE is actually available on standard edition these days, so you want to get to 2019, so you get in there. Uh, and then next up we have Hernan from over on YouTube says, what's the most efficient way to update a number of rows with a stored procedure? Do I call a stored procedure for each row updated or pass all the values to be updated in via JSON or XML? So what I'll do is I'm going to zoom this out a little bit and I'm going to say, how do I know which query runs faster? If you would, because what you'll want to do is build two versions of it so that you can see and learn for yourself. You build both versions of it and then you compare the execution plans. If you want to learn about that process, I've got several free videos on it. So if you Google for watch Brent tune queries, if you Google for watch Brent tune queries, I've got several videos where I walk you through the process of comparing two execution plans to figure out which one is better and how you want to go about tuning them. So go Google for watch Brent tune queries and you'll learn about doing that process. So why am I sending you there? Because there are times where one process is better, there are times where the other approach is better. It's going to depend on your workloads, your tables, the amounts of indexes on your tables, all kinds of stuff like that. So I'd rather you find out the process for doing it rather than you getting a bad answer from some yo-yo who happens to just have a live stream. Next up, let's see here. Um, not the DBA you're looking for says, isn't there a Stack Overflow page where you get queries that need tuning for the Stack Overflow database? Yes, it's called Stack Exchange Data Explorer. Stack Exchange Data Explorer. Next up, let's see here. Let's copy a couple of things over into the queue. Uh, let's see here. Farshid says, some businesses are based on Windows or biased on Windows security and forcing DBAs to move to SQL on Linux. That's one case I had. Okay, cool. Um, then next up, 
CTI says, uh, my friend touched on this, or you talk, touched on this topic yesterday. We have a ton of jobs running from agent. I'm thinking about changing it all to run off a separate server via task scheduler and PowerShell. Will I keep, keep database backups on SQL server agent jobs? This comes back to my change equals risk. So what I, when someone wants to go do something, what I'd say is, let's sit with your business, go run SP Blitz, and go look at the health issues on your SQL Server today to prioritize what you need to fix. Because otherwise, I'm worried that we might be just changing something for the, the sake of changing it. You only get so many hours a day. Like I use this a lot during my mastering classes. I'll give myself 30 minutes in order to go work on something. And I'm like, at the end of this 30 minutes, people have to have a noticeable difference in whatever it is that I did. I don't want to be just like shining my you know, keyboard or getting tuning my keyboard lighting or something. You know, it's got to be something that people notice the difference when I'm done. So just before you go down that rabbit hole, probably go uh, ask the business, what's your biggest problem today? Uh, let's see here. Now, Le Ignacio says, uh, what do you think is the difference between a basic SQL user uh, with an intermediate one? Um, I don't really have a good answer to that. Um, I don't really have a good answer to that. Uh, and I, I don't know that, that I'd really care either. It sounds kind of goofy, but um, if, if someone wants, let me rephrase your question as, how do I get better at SQL? Like, how do I know that I'm getting better at SQL? Read a book by Itzik ben Gan. I'll show you. <laughs> So if you go to uh, Amazon, oh, and it's actually on my books page too. If you go to brentozar.com slash go slash books, if you go to brentozar.com slash go slash books, I've got my recommended list of SQL Server books. And these are a few books that you could read from Itzik Ben Gan that will help your T-SQL level up. These are absolutely phenomenal. These are not easy. These are very hard books, and they'll help you understand whether you're really getting better at SQL or not. All right, coming down the home stretch, got a couple of questions left before we call it a day. Sebastian says, your thoughts on the future of SQL? Um, <laughs> hmm. Uh, my thoughts on the future of SQL. It's great. It's fantastic. Um, of course, I say that because I'm making a lot of money on it. You know, it's, it's if I th okay. So here's that's probably a good way to say it. If I thought it was dead, if I thought that SQL Server was dead, you would see me moving off of it. But I don't. I have a lot of work doing it. From the stage, when you hear folks like Microsoft talking, it's all, all Azure all the time because that's where they're going to make money at. If they can get you to Azure, where they get you to pay by the CPU cycle and they get you to pay by the month and you're locked into it and you can't go anywhere else, you, if you listen to their presentations about, everyone's moving to Azure, it's incredible, it helps you do all your things. We're not going to talk about our monthly bills here. We're just going to talk about how empowered we all are. So it, it would sound like everything's happening over in Azure. That SQL Server stuff that's predictable and cost and cheap, don't pay attention to that. The real action's over here. Please hand your wallet in at the door. You know, so I, I get, I, I'm like, hey, you know, hey. It's not, SQL Server isn't as dead as you would think it to be. Uh, and then last up, Amen says, uh, any idea on how to use GPUs for a SQL Server workload? So no, the Postgres community has done some work on that in trying to get Postgres to use GPUs. But the thing is, a SQL Server is licensed by the CPU. So because they're licensed by the CPU, they put all their work into CPU. They haven't really put any work into GPU, even though there are some workloads that you would think would be better off in terms of GPUs. If they did start putting that in, they would have to do all kinds of crazy work and testing, and most SQL servers just don't have GPUs and won't. You know, most cloud VMs have, exactly, yeah, imagine licensing a graphics core with, or a graphics card with a couple of thousand cores. Just the licensing doesn't start to make any sense. So you won't see SQL Server going down that route anytime soon. If you want to do that, if you want to use the same hardware that you play Fortnite on and also run a database server on it, go check out Postgres. And I don't say that is bad, but it's, it's wonderful. 
Uh, GB, just last question I'll do. Do you work with Eric? No, he used to be my employee, but then I uh, decided to stop having consulting employees because I don't really like having consulting employees. It's a whole lot of work. Um, so I sent him off and he goes and has his own consulting company now, Eric Darling Data. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everyone, for hanging out with me today. Thanks to Surly Dev2 as well for doing the moderation there on the questions. Uh, thanks, everyone, for hanging out, and I will see you all next week. I'm off downstairs to go get myself some uh, lox and bagel. Adios. <laughs>